Thanks, Tim. So, uh, like Tim said, I am Director of Global Projects at the Tax Foundation. Tax Foundation is a tax policy group based in Washington, D.C. We've been around since 1937, one of the older tax policy groups in the world, um, and particularly in the United States. And we do tax policy research not only focused on in the international side of things, as Tim was describing, but for most of our past, we've only focused on the United States. We focused on individual state policies and federal policy. So going global, which is something that we're trying to do, um, is something of a, a, a new thing for us. But the lessons that I'm going to be talking about here, the tools that I'm going to be talking about here, I think are applicable to uh, many different contexts where you're looking at tax policy and you're trying to identify opportunities for reform, being able to measure success, and being able to successfully uh, engage in a debate and see results. So I'm going to start from kind of a, a broad perspective of what I think when uh, a lot of different groups enter into tax policy debates, and then move to kind of a principled-based uh, approach to tax policy, then talk about some of the tools that we use and the ways we engage in tax policy at different levels of government, and hopefully at the end of it we'll all have a better understanding of ways that we can use research, education, engagement, in order to improve the tax systems in our countries or in our states, depending on whether you are in a country that has states that have a sovereign tax authority, um, like in the US. There are a few federal systems out there, of course. And then, once I'm done, we're gonna take, I'm going to take some questions, and then we'll move into some lessons that groups around the world have learned, some case studies that they've experienced um, in uh, advocating for tax policy reforms and seeing some, some results. So. Tools for tax reform. One of the issues with tax policy, and many policy areas are like this, but we're talking about taxes today, is a lot of times we have the problem of the blind men and the elephant. There is a particular issue that someone is really engaged with on the tax uh, front, and they really only know that issue, but they don't see the big picture. And, no, and everyone else is kind of engaged in their little area. Oh, this is something that the manufacturers hate and it's the problem that they, you know, they address every day. Or this is the problem that the uh, retirees face and they hate and they uh, see problems with it every day. But there's not a unified approach to tax policy as far as a way to move the debate forward and to achieve change and results. Tax reform is a very difficult issue partially because of the way uh, tax policy interacts with uh, the economy, with individual decision making. It can be incredibly complex for any given tax issue. You could probably spend thousands of dollars and thousands of and, and, and hire hundreds of lawyers to be able to determine whether or not the issue that you're trying to face as an entrepreneur or as an individual um, should be uh, addressed in one way or another, or simply tax filing. It's incredibly complex and it can be very difficult to identify what priorities you should focus on if you're entering into an you know, a, a time where there's an opportunity for tax reform. What should be the first thing that you should um, address? What are things that the grassroots might be interested in? Um, what are things that the media needs to be educated upon? All these different things can, be, uh, can make tax reform a real problem for a taxpayer group or a think tank to be able to tackle. So let's start with the principles. From the Tax Foundation's views, these are the four principles that we use to identify good tax policy. Simplicity, transparency, neutrality, and stability. Starting from a principled-based approach allows you to move into a policy debate and be able to call, as we say in the US, call balls and strikes, call things according to a standard, uh, and be able to engage honestly with policymakers. And when someone comes up with some crazy idea, you're, you're able to push back and say, hey, that doesn't fit with the principles of sound po tax policy. So let's go through these principles. First of all, simplicity. Tax codes should be easy for taxpayers to comply with and for governments to administer and enforce. The tax burden, in a lot of ways, is directly connected to complexity. Uh, the amount of time it takes to file your tax returns, the how, how difficult it is to uh, get your refunds back if you feel like the government uh, took too much out of withholding, and, and things like that. The second principle, transparency. Tax policies, policies should clearly and plainly define what taxpayers must pay, when they must pay it, and disguising burdens in complex structures should be avoided. Any changes to the tax code should be made with careful consideration, input, 
and open hearings. This allows for a public debate over whatever it is that you're trying, uh, re whatever reform you're trying to achieve. A lot of times when you're strategically thinking about a, a reform effort, you know, you might want to think in a procedural manner how to stack the deck in favor of your success. However, that may not improve the long-term success of whatever your project um, whatever your project is. If you're able to stack the deck from a procedural standpoint, you may get your win temporarily, but you may not have won over the public support necessary to keep the change long term. The transparency in that effort, um, it can be really important for taxpayers as people um, are aware of what's being done with the tax code. Neutrality. Taxes by nature can influence and do influence uh, individual decision making. And tax policy sh should neither encourage nor discourage personal or business decisions. The purpose of taxes is to raise needed revenue and not favor or punish specific industries, activities, and products. Minimizing tax preferences, and a lot of these tax prefer preferences show up in consumption taxes in your VAT. Think of all the VAT exemptions um, or uh, GST exemptions for different tax, um, taxes on consumption. Uh, minimizing tax preferences broadens the tax base so that the government can raise sufficient revenue with lower rates. For every exemption or special carve out or subsidy through a tax code, that increases the marginal tax rate faced by everyone else who is not exempt. So in fact, while you may be thinking that you're favoring a particular product or, or, or helping out uh, poor families that, uh, or, or folks who are trying to uh, uh, buy clothes for their children. What you're really doing is increasing marginal rates on everyone else. And if you're wanting to exempt necessities or things like that, you're creating a system that inherently is designed to punish those who don't have the loudest lobbying voice, um, which is uh, which is a, a whole other discussion all in and of itself. The fourth principle: stability. Taxpayers deserve consistency and predictability in the tax code. Governments should avoid enacting temporary tax laws, including tax holidays, amnesties, and retroactive changes. The US just went through a significant tax reform in 2017. A large chunk of the changes that were achieved in 2017, however, have an ex expiration date. All of the individual tax cuts will expire in 2027 unless Congress acts to extend them. There's a provision that allows businesses to write off the cost of their investment in the first year. That will expire, I believe, in 2024. And all of these things create uncertainty, it creates instability, and it makes it more difficult for people to be able to say, hey, I'm making a decision that's going to impact how I do business for the next 20 years. I need to know how the tax code is going to impact my profitability. I need to know whether or not I need to be uh, looking at other risks, political risks, uh, due to the fact that the tax code is unstable. It's very important to be fighting for things that are consistent and stable in tax law so that you're not surprising folks um, or basically making retroactive decisions as we've seen recently um, with the loan charge in, in the UK. Significant impacts that retroactive tax policy can have. Uh, so this is the project. So we've been through uh, the, the problem and the principles, now we're at the project. When tax foundation comes into a, a state, or we're talk, talking to policymakers at the federal level, or we're talking to policymakers on the international scene, these are generally our goals. Look at ways to lower marginal tax rates, adopt neutral tax policies, and remove distortive tax policies. Those are two sides to the same coin, but oftentimes if you're only moving forward on the neutrality side but not getting rid of the distortive side, you may not be making net uh, movement. Uh, and supporting economic growth. These are all laudable goals, and it's um, an opportunity for messaging and communication to take these goals and to take them to groups uh, that aren't necessarily in line with uh, lower taxes generally, but to look at how these different goals interact with society, interact with decision making, uh, and, uh, and can impact individuals and families um, for, for the long, long run. So. How do we get from big problem to achieving those goals? These are three pillars that we look at when we're thinking about how we engage um, a project. 
Um, so the pathway is research, education, and engagement. And all of these, um, I, I would say, are of equal importance at the beginning. It's possible that by the time you move to the success, you, you found out that, well, education was the thing that really got things done. But if you're st from starting from a point of, okay, there's an opportunity to change tax policy, what do we need to do? You probably need to do all three of these things. So research, compare the tax system to other systems. So one of the things that we really like to do is pit states and countries against one, one another from a competitive sense and say, hey, Estonia has a fantastic corporate tax system. You should look at, at the Estonian system. Or hey, you know, France got rid of their wealth tax. Maybe you should too. Um, and things like that. Uh, or perform in-depth analysis to identify reform opportunities. One of the things that we have um, uh, a little bit uh, of a conversation around in the Tax Foundation is paying attention to where the problems are. Um, one of my colleagues likes to say you, you have to identify where the pain is. Um, when people are looking at, at, at tax code or, or whatever um, it is, issue, particular tax issue is affecting them, it may not be on your radar. It may not show up in the top marginal rate or uh, it may not show up in the tax burden overall. It may be an administrative issue or it may be some carve out for a particular business that all the other businesses hate because they don't get that carve out and it's creating problems with uh, problems politically and you have to identify that um, and a research effort engaging with taxpayers, engaging with the data can allow you to identify those, uh, those issues. Education, providing the public with information about specific parts of the tax system and developing fact sheets and primers. A lot of the educational effort is not necessarily educating other tax experts, right? Most of the public is mo engaged with taxes one or maybe two times a year, depending on how the tax filing system works. And engaging them with information that would be helpful for them to understand their situation, help them see where their peers might be looking at a tax policy issue um, and, uh, and being impacted by it, whether it's an entrepreneur or uh, you know, a single mother or, or, or different stories to help people understand how the tax system interacts with decision making. And then fact sheets and primers. These things can be very helpful in engaging with the media to be able to say, hey, this is an issue that's going to be coming up. The government's really going to be looking at tax reform. Here's how you can understand as, as, an, um, as a media personality or as a journalist how this tax works. And we're help, uh, going to help you understand how the policy works so that when you write on it, you know how, the, uh, how it works. And then engagement. And then uh, directly with um, engaging with uh, journalists uh, who write on tax policy, as I was just mentioning, briefing policymakers on opportunities for reform, and building alliances with influential stakeholders. You cannot get a tax reform done without paying attention to all the stakeholders in the game. Now, there are some stakeholders that would be aligned with you and some who aren't, but if you don't know what the counter arguments are going to be to whatever points you're going to be making about the tax code, you may be shooting yourself in the foot from, from the get-go. Engaging with other stakeholders can help you build a coalition to be able to say, hey, we're coming into a, uh, to this tax reform debate with these principles and these goals. Can we share these principles and can we share these goals to be able to get an eventual reform that makes the entire country or entire state or, uh, or whatever um, better in competitive terms or better for families, better for um, workers, better for entrepreneurs? Building those alliances, connecting with journalists, helping to educate, those are all things that can set you up for longer term success, especially when it comes to the, the question of uh, whether the technical debate is going to get bogged down into details or if there's going to be a movement that's going to push the, push the debate forward um, and have a permanent success. So here are the tools that Tax Foundation has developed to be able to do research and to educate and to engage uh, on some levels. So we use these different tools um, in, in many different contexts. And they're all, they're, in some cases, they're conversation pieces, you know, very top level analysis. And, some, and in other cases, they're deep analysis and very technical analysis to be able to engage the more, um, uh, the more technical uh, folks in, in the tax policy debate. You know, if you're, if you're doing a tax reform, there will be people at your finance ministry or your treasury department, however your government is organized, who are going to be very, very engaged with the technical details of how taxes work. So in order to be able to engage with them, you, you have to show that level of expertise as well. Um, 
So Tax Freedom Day, many of you are familiar with this concept. It measures how much a country taxes. It's a great educational tool for the public to be able to say, you worked one quarter of the year for the government and now you get to work for yourself. And it, it's, it's a measure that we've seen a lot of different countries adopting to, uh, and think tanks around the world adopting to be able to identify uh, the tax burden in their particular jurisdiction. Uh, the International Tax Competitiveness Index is a report that we've been doing for the past five years that looks at OECD countries, and it measures the neutrality and efficiency of how a, how a country taxes. So this is different than a measure of the tax burden. It's a measurement of how efficient the tax system is. We want to say that a particular tax system is good if marginal rates are low, and if, it's, um, if the burden is not, um, not, not too great as far as um, the uh, compliance burden and things like that. And it compares countries on corporate, labor, consumption, property, and international tax policies. And here's a little bit more about it. So for Asia Pacific and the Americas in the index, um, we have New Zealand down there at the, uh, as the best. So this is, you know, the lower, the lower you're ranked, the better. Um, then Australia ranked eight all the way through um, Chile, um, which is ranked 31st on our index. And I have copies of the index out in the, uh, at, at my display table if you'd like to come by and pick one up later. Again, this is uh, focused on OECD countries. One of the things that we've been hearing over the last year or so, though, is a lot of countries that aren't OECD countries would really like to see how their country compares on this type of measure. So we're trying to work with groups around the world to be able to have comparable analysis, whether it's not, you know, whether or not it's year on year or just fitting into the framework on a one-off basis. Um, we're trying to build this out to be able to compare a lot of other, uh, other countries as well. So the U.S., U.S. ranked 24th. Um, uh, Lyle, uh, in the last session, talked a little bit about uh, how Tax Foundation engaged in the tax policy debate um, in tax reform. Uh, so we were ranked in the high 20s and we moved up to 24. Hooray. You know, we've got, you know, 24 slots left to go before we're in number one. Um, but it's an opportunity for us to be able to say consistently year after year we're using the same measure we're using the same kind of analysis to be able to say okay well there was a move, movement forward there's lots of room left to go uh, and to be able to continue to go back to policymakers and identify ways um, for um, opportunities for reform so high-ranking countries in the index have low corporate tax rates allow fast recovery of capital costs they have territorial tax systems low individual tax rates and a few other things. Poor ranking countries, on the other hand, have everything that's opposite of those measures. And the strength, so Estonia ranks best in the uh, International Tax Competitiveness Index and has done so year after year because it has a very efficient tax system and has a 20% corporate income tax that only applies when earnings are distributed outside of the company. 20% uh, VAT rate that's put on a broad base and minimal complexity. They have a very digitized tax system that makes it very easy to comply with. And property taxes only apply to the value of land. So if there are any Georgists in the room, they have a land value tax in Estonia that is effectively administered. Weaknesses, on the other hand, of the French tax system. So France has ranked last on our index for all five years that we've done it. A headline corporate rate of 34.4%, highest among the OECD uh, countries, and they have multiple distortionary property taxes. When you're taxing the same income multiple times, you're going to be punished in our index. And the tax burden on labor is 47.6%, so that's almost 50% of your gross earnings are taken away in labor taxes. Uh, it's one of the highest in, the OECD, in OECD countries. Uh, comparative analysis, moving along from, to our different tools. We look at tax structure, sources of revenue in different countries. We look at the tax burden on labor. The OECD does some fantastic reports on these uh, topics, but it's not really distilled in a way that's accessible to uh, the general citizen. So what we do is we t just take OECD data and distill it into a more readable report. Also, their reports, just to uh, bat on the OECD for a minute, um, their, their reports, unless you pay for them, are only, uh, you can only scroll through them on your screen and you can't do word searches on them, so it's incredibly difficult to deal with. So, if you want to read OECD data in an understandable format, come to the Tax Foundation. <clears throat> capital cost allowances. Capital cost allowances, this is one of my favorite topics in tax, but almost nobody else cares about it unless you're a manufacturer. Capital cost allowances 
or the allowances that businesses have to be able to deduct against their income if they are investing. So if you're a business, let's say, let's say you're a kitchen uh, or a, a, re a restaurant and you want to build a larger kitchen and you want to spend, you know, let's say $50,000 um, expanding your kitchen. In a lot of instances, you would not be able to deduct the cost of $50,000 against your income in that first year. No, you would have to amortize that. You would have to write that off over, you would have to depreciate it over a series of years and you would end up not being able to write off the entire um, amount because inflation erodes the value of money um, and the real return you would get on that also erodes the, the time value of money. So you would, uh, so in uh, a lot of OECD countries, you're only be able to write off 70 to 80% of your actual capital costs. Um, so we compare countries on capital cost allowances because it's important um, to not punish investment um, because investment is critical to long-term economic growth. Corporate tax rates around the world, I have a nice chart there that looks at the average corporate tax rates that have been coming down significantly over the last uh, number of years. Dan Mitchell mentioned that uh, trend this morning. We also do economic analysis and this is something that we've focused a lot of effort on at the U.S. federal level. We have a macroeconomic model that you, looks at U.S. federal tax policy, and this is a table from one of our reports on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the 2017 reform, um, that looked at how that tax reform changed long-run GDP, the capital stock over the long run, um, wages, and full-time equivalent jobs. This is an incredible tool for policymakers because policymakers love to talk about growth, right? We want to improve wages, we want to improve the number of jobs, we want to improve growth. We're able to measure that in a way that's credible and that's comparable to other groups that are doing macroeconomic estimates and in a way that helps policymakers understand what tax policy changes actually improve growth. Simply cutting taxes doesn't necessarily improve growth unless you're improving the efficiency of the system and removing distortions. So that's one of the tools that we use to communicate on, on tax policy. This is the way we think about growth. And this is a very simple model. If you're an economist, you know that there's a lot more detail and a lot more theory behind this. But we look at tax changes that, that can increase or decrease the cost of capital or the cost of labor. And those two determine the capital so uh, stock, the amount of tools, equipment, and buildings in an economy, and the labor supply. And both of those contribute to economic growth. So tax policy flows through in this way to impact economic growth. We also do tax primers. These are simple, you know, three to four page uh, primers on a certain tax topic. We want policymakers and journalists and, um, uh, and folks who are wanting to engage in tax policy to understand how a tax works in a simple way uh, and be able to allow uh, kind of an entry point into understanding tax policy. We also do longer tax reform guides. So our state uh, tax policy uh, 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 team has done probably 10 of these books looking at different states. Um, but in the last year, we've started looking at ways we can do this on a global scale. So earlier this year, we published, along with the Hayek Institute in Vienna, a tax reform guide uh, for, the, uh, for Austria. Austri the Austrian government was in the midst of developing a tax reform um, agenda, and we thought it was an opportunity for us to engage with pro-growth ideas, and we identified uh, kind of uh, a range of ideas around whether uh, they wanted to do uh, just uh, pragmatic, minimal reforms or something more aggressive. Now, the story's changed a little bit because the Austrian government is in a little political crisis right now, uh, but. These, are, these can be incredible uh, tools to help educate policymakers and the public. And then, once you do the research, education, and engagement, perhaps we might not have the blind men and the elephant, but everyone talking tax reform. And moving from the blind men and the elephant to everyone talking tax reform is an incredible amount of work. And there are different ways to go about it in, in different contexts, and there are different constituencies or interest groups that you'll have to deal with. But regardless of the situation, these tools can be a help uh, to engage the public. Um, they're all very research focused and there's opportunities for education. But generally speaking, these are tools that you can move the conversation forward. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to take you know, simple data points and turn them into stories and turn them into movements and be able to see politicians you know, take your ideas and run with them. Uh, one of the most uh, incredible things uh, during tax reform um, 
was when, um, actually in 2016, one of the, one of the things that, that we were able to experience um, was all the presidential candidates that were running, running for president all came to the Tax Foundation at different points and said, hey, we want to talk about pro-growth tax policy. We know Rand Paul's doing this. We want to do, do him one better. Well, how can we do Paul, Rand Paul one better? How can we have a better tax plan than, than Ted Cruz? How can we have a better, better tax plan than Jeb Bush? And then Donald Trump came along and he said, we want you to sign a non-disclosure agreement before we talk to you on tax policy. And then we said, no. We're, we're not going to sign a non-disclosure agreement, but we will talk to you in confidence and then, and then release the results. And, and oddly enough, his original campaign plan was one of the worst of the bunch, um, but we ended up with a halfway, halfway decent result at the end. Um, but these tools can bring, bring um, opportunities to you uh, that, um, that show your credibility, that show your independence, being able to say, hey, we are coming at this from a principles-based approach. Um, and Tax Foundation would love to partner with any of your organizations um, to either teach you how to use these tools or develop new tools that would be uh, appropriate for your context. So with that, I'm going to transition to uh, a time of questions. I should have mentioned at the beginning that you can use the Whova app um, to, uh, to send me questions and I can uh, check on questions if I get to that. Um, or we can, okay, we have, let's see here. Um, how does a country know its international t tax competitiveness score if it's not in the OECD? This is a great question. So one of the reasons we use OECD countries is because we can have comparable data year after year. Um, because if you're developing an index um, for a particular uh, measuring, measuring pol uh, a certain set policy set, you want to be able to have um, uh, updates to that every year. Uh, one of the things we tried to do uh, a couple years ago was include China and India in the index, and we realized that while we could probably get a single year's worth of data, um, it would have been um, incredibly unlikely for us to get an update to that data year after year after year to be able to include them again. So what we're trying to do right now is figure out how we can include countries um, in, the t in the framework for the International Tax Competitiveness Index um, without necessarily having have them ranked, um, so it's kind of a, a, a weird, a weird situation. So um, my friend Gia, who's here somewhere um, from Georgia, um, has written um, uh, something for us that we're probably going to be publishing later this year on Georgia's tax system, and our goal with that is to be able to say, okay, Georgia's tax system looks like this on these different measures of corporate tax, um, labor taxes, or property taxes, and so forth. And if it you know, were in the index, it would probably rank similarly to these countries. So it would probably, you know, knowing the Georgian tax system, it would probably be close to Latvia and Estonia, very close to the top of the index because they have similar tax policies. Um, for other countries, it might be a little bit more difficult because of um, the disparities in different, different taxes. But we're, we're working with several groups to do write-ups of their tax systems and be able to publish those um, analyses in the similar time frame as our International Tax Competitiveness Index and try to describe those in a similar context. Um, so we're not necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily be able to in, uh, uh, include them in the, uh, the ranking and the scoring, but in the same kind of framework. So I hope, that, hope that's uh, helpful. So we're going to pivot very much from the um, from the think tank into town to the pressure group um, model, and I'm going to talk about um, we'll do a, just a, a bit of a focus in on what we called our X this tax uh, campaign, which was a recent win we had. So I'll just but before I begin, I want to give you um, just a little bit of context. So we have a uh, a new Prime Minister from uh, 2017, Jacinda Ardern, um, who had as um, a party, she was head of the Labour Party, the party had proposed a capital gains tax in New Zealand at both the 2011 and 2014 election. By the time Jacinda became uh, the leader of Labour, it had been part um, uh, to what they were calling a tax working group. They said, look, this is all too hard, this is going to cost us votes, um, we're going to put it to a group of experts and then um, not implement anything until after the 2020 election. So when they were elected into government, we knew we had quite a, we, we had quite a fight, not only that this working group, but then it was going to be a primary um, uh, campaign or election campaign issue. So we had planned an 18 month campaign. So that is the, the context. So I'll work through, I've got a... 
So our first step was to engage with this tax, um, tax working group and we see our role as being the voice for taxpayers um, and what our primary objective of last year was to maximise the number of people engaged with that process. I mean, we know that the left, particularly the, um, the unions at home for example, get every um, Tom, Dick and Harry paid union staff are out on the street collecting signatures and getting them to sign form submissions and things like that. Our aim was to, st um, to match them and we did it. Um, we did it using um, draft submissions that we allowed our members and supporters to edit as they wished. We gave them um, um, uh, suggested phrasing and then also did separately quite a comprehensive submission. But we ended up, and this is um, our highlight of last year, with 70% of the submissions made to the tax working group, to the, the replies to their draft proposals, were by our supporters. And, um, and that meant that in the final tax working group report um, they could not claim um, that they had public support despite the efforts of the various um, left wing group. Yeah. The second thing we did is, and we moved now to this year, is we knew in January the group were reporting back the draft proposals. So the timeline was last year was consultation, January the report was out, um, and in April the government um, was responding um, uh, to the report. So that was our sort of key focus of, um, uh, of the campaign. And what we wanted to do, our strategy was rather than focus on the economic arguments around a capital gains tax, you saw earlier that New Zealand compares very well, the key difference we've got is we don't tax capital, which is where so much of that complexity in a tax system comes. Now that's why we were fighting it. But we knew we were engaged with the other side that was framing the whole thing about fairness. A capital gains tax, it's only fair. And so what our um, objective of the first few months of the campaign was we want to define fairness. And so we did that um, with a series of um, full page newspaper ads based off a report we called the five rules for a capital gains tax. No tax on inflation, so inde indexation of, um, of capital valuations. Um, a reduced rate compared to income tax. Grandfathering of assets, as the Australians did. If you already own the asset, you don't have a big valuation day when you bring it in. It doesn't come into the regime until it's sold. Um, roll um, rollover relief to avoid it turning into a death tax. Uh, and revenue neutrality, we called on any money that was, um, that was brought in. Um, would be cut in taxes, uh, cut in other areas. And we actually achieved, even before the report came back, we actually forced the government on that last one. They said that it would be um, revenue neutral. So when the report came out, what we did is we linked back to uh, those five rules and had um, full page ads um, very um, quickly where it was fail, 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 um, four, of the, four of the five rules were broken. And we were about to launch our campaign and then of course Christchurch happened, um, which uh, 72 hours before our campaign launch, um, so I had to pull it. So we were then condensed even more um, until the government's um, response was back. Let me just go through. So we identified, um, <clears throat> what we then did after we launched is we were driving very much on people being able to contact directly the key decision makers which were one the Prime Minister and two the Deputy Prime Minister which leads the smaller party that holds the balance of power our most obvious route to victory was to get, um, get them to veto it. And in, in the, first, uh, the first 48 hours of, the, um, of launching our online tool to email those decision makers, the Prime Minister was receiving an email a minute um, and we achieved 5,000 within, within 14 days. This was through full page newspaper ads online, all driving to, um, to this website. We also got significant coverage in simply um, uh, releasing the 
um, officials' reports on where the revenue would come from. We exposed that two thirds of the revenue um, was simply from inflation over the first 10 years. And what we had from all these people using our tools, both for the submissions and then the direct <coughs> engagement, is we had available all these stories from New Zealanders about how it would affect them. And you'll see that in there we got people to do little videos, but also when you look, the chap there on the, um, on the bottom, on the News Hub piece, he led the news um, David King, he was a, um, he's a chap who owned a flooring business, he built up this business in his whole life and would be heavily impacted by this tax, and he, we provided, what we found is that media were coming to us looking for the stories to hook around uh, this issue. The other thing we do is we, re to really target those people that are most affected, we actually brought lists for people that owned pro large properties that we knew would be particularly impacted um, by into direct mail. Um, I mentioned in my talk yesterday about the coalition meeting, um, we brought together all the, we, we monitored anyone saying um, anything negative on the capital gains tax and invited them to our coalition meeting um, and brought in, we actually had a a member of the tax working group who wrote the minority report come and presented our first, um, our first one. We took the fight um, to Parliament. The day the pro-capital gains tax campaign launched, we asked questions on who they were funded by, and it turns out it included organisations funded by taxpayers. And we actually won the news round, their high, um, their high watermark, um, we managed to put it back onto them and the questions all on the first day were who was funding that campaign. You see there this petition card, that's what we sent to the many thousands of, um, of property owners that we wrote to. This tax, it, it had, this tax affects you. Or we actually phrased it, Dr Cullen, who was leading the tax working group, is coming for you. Um, You'll see here, I've got right at the end, what we found with, by operating those, um, the forums and by bringing all the groups together, we actually started to find we led it. Down the, um, uh, even the National Party, that's the leader of the opposition, retweeting our, um, our research um, uh, on it. And so in conclusion, I see I've got um, only one minute left. I'll tell you what happened. The Prime Minister on the 17th of April announced that there would be no capital gains tax for as long as she is Prime Minister. She said she wanted to, but the Deputy Prime Minister said to media the same day that there was no public appetite for it and the final decision was only made in the last few hours and that's how we axe the tax. Thank you. Hi everybody. Yeah, well, I'm Ines again and I'm representing the Peruvian Asso Taxpayer Association. Uh, Okay, uh, let's start. First of all, I, I'm, I'm going to make an apologize in advance uh, if I made some mistakes with my English, just, just in case. Well, um, I'm going to tell you today three of our initiatives, two that are, are really, really involved with taxes and another one that we are involved in, in these days. The first one is the tax regime for small and medium uh, sized uh, companies that for us is MIPES. Um, okay, this is a sneak peek of the Peruvian business environment back in 2015. 89% of the business force were made from MIPES. And this brings like 63% of the employment of the country. But 85% of them were informal. The main problem was tax, uh, the tax system according to the International Labor Organization. Well, this, those three were like the tax, tax regimes uh, in that time. We have those, RAS and RARE were like a kind of simple, more regimes, but with some limitations for really, really small businesses. And we had another general regime, like for any other kind of businesses, like accounting, tax, legal, labor, cost, that are equals to those big, and large enterprises even, like international companies. But what happened? As you can see, 40% of micro-businesses were in RAS, 22% micro-businesses in RARE, and then you have 89% small businesses were in general regime, and 
38% uh, from micro businesses of micro businesses were in general regime. The main thing with this is that um, the main thing that differentiate this each of these regimes were like the amount of in income that the, the companies have yearly. So these small, medium uh, businesses in the, in the general regime have struggled a lot with the all the requirements they have to follow to for this kind of spe specific regime. So what we do? Uh, basically, three main things. First of all, research. We make uh, an extensive research about like all these three regimes that I've been talking about. And also, we run some, t uh, we run some um, discussion tables with uh, decision makers, specialists, but the most important for us was working with uh, associations of businesses. Because actually they were, they were the ones that suffering with these tax regimes. So we discover a lot of, in, uh, we take a lot of inputs from them and then uh, bring them back in our research. And also we work really close with the Peruvian tax authority. And we m get some meetings with them to get them advices about what our findings and tracking this initiative. So in December of 2016, there was uh, the executive approved a uh, legislative decree approving this new tax regime for the MIPES. So they created a special regime with tax benefits and lesser requirements. So to put it in simple, these small and micro businesses that were in the, in, in the regular regime before used to pay 30% uh, for income. Now they pay 10%. And also, I mean, they're able to expand any kind of uh, payment proofs also. Eight months later of the approval of this um, kind of law, uh, 416,000 taxpayers incorporated to the, this new taxpayer regime. 74,000 of them coming from the rare and Rus because they found like, uh, way more uh, useful to use the new rules for them. What we see also is that this 89% of the business force become to 96.5% of the whole enterprises in the country. They hire like eight, more than 8 million people by that time, but it still is a lot of informality uh, we need to work in. In March of this year, 641,000 of taxpayers are in this regime. Okay, uh, the next initiative that I want to talk about is about what is popularized in our country as like the BAT uh, fair. Okay, I'm gonna run a bit because I... Okay, this is back again in 2015. What happened, the main problem is that MIPES should have uh, pay the VAT to the authority. But uh, the goods and services they provide were paid on, uh, are, are frequently paid on credit. So the payment they receive in like 60 or 90 days after they sell their services or goods, which causes a lack of liquidity. The actions we have made, uh, we take, again, research, is the main paper of the previous uh, initiative. Again, dialogue with business uh, represented uh, associations and specialists. This time we promote uh, initiative through the, le the legislative di directly through a congressman and we follow up the idea. And this, and this time we have a little bit more support of media and we create a kind of a public impact about this matter. So the government measures uh, were in August of 2016. This congressman, um, I mean, in some way, I think we were clever because we work with a, a lawyer of taxes. So this congressman were really able to understand the issue with this. And he presented a project of law in August. And he was from the main party of the Congress. So in December of 2016, the law passed. 
So eight months later, after the, it being approved, this law, uh, 51,000 taxpayers welcome and accept this new regime. And the, in the postponed VAT debt increase in 92.6 million soles. Okay, the last initiative that I want to talk about is investment in hydrocarbons. Okay, to put it simple, we made a research about it and in, a, in a specific region in Peru, and we discovered there's a lot of um, difficulties to Im uh, improve oil um, activity investment in our country because government is not taking initiatives to promote it. And even when we discovered that the average income increases when the um, hydrocarbon activities are promoted and uh, poverty decreases. But we also uh, use this uh, research to understand the proper, the proper use of the economic contribution in the extractive industry. Okay, what we made, basically, as I told you, we made a research, but also now we have a more encouraged um, force in the public impact in communication. So we have a really big impact with this initiative in the region, but also in a nation, in a nation range. And authorities answer, actually, about our findings. So the head of the public university of the region that it's supposed he's spending money in, in investigation and research, he said this, he's doing that. We asked for information, we, never, we didn't receive information. The budget manager of the region also informed that he will evaluate and supervise the investment, the proper investment of the money coming from these extractive activities. And finally, the head of the government accountability office had a meeting with the governor of the region and in many of, of the topics they talk about, uh, they also talk about supervise and use the economic contribution of these activities. So one month later, there's a new project of law that pursue or pro um, proposed to regulate investments made on resources from the economic contribution in public universities exclusively in investigation um, projects followed by a uh, main entity of the government. Well, and just to finish, please follow us in our social media. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I was going to do a presentation about a specific campaign, much like uh, some of the other guys have done, but I was sitting at breakfast this morning and decided to change my mind because I was thinking about a conversation I had with our grassroots campaign manager several years ago because he was holding lots of action days around the country. What the Taxpayers Alliance does, actually, we get outside of London quite often. Um, we go out into the regions of the country that nobody else will go to and we hold action days on, on various issues, sometimes very localised, sometimes about big national issues, but just outside of London. And I was talking to our campaign manager about it and he said, look, you know, every time I try and talk to people on our action days, they say to me, sorry, mate, I don't pay tax. And when he got talking to them, he realised actually they don't pay tax. They might have a part-time job, they might live in social housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So our campaigns weren't really hitting home. Um, our action days weren't getting much results. So what we we all know that w when you actually fly, drive, watch TV in the UK with the BBC, when you when you buy food, when you do whatever it is, you're paying tax somewhere along the way. So we decided to take a step back and not talk about specific taxes in their area but to actually say, do you even realise how much tax you pay and you pay it on everything? So um, we made these banners. It's indicative of a broader campaign we were doing at the time. But um, we had Chloe, Olivia, and what apparently is Sherlock Holmes by the look of it. <laughs> but um, uh, we went out and we started doing these awareness campaigns about, you know, you do realise you do pay tax, even if you are on a part-time job and you are below the tax threshold. You are paying tax every single time you make a decision in your day. Um, so that was pretty successful. Um, sorry, where's the clicker? Um, and that, out, that allows us then to go back to that same area with a bit more power to say your council tax increase of 6% um, actually matters because they realise then that they, they are taxpayers much like everybody else. Um, another thing that we do is we target um, tax campaigns uh, on a consumer basis really and we try and target the place exactly where the, the tax the the taxes hurt most. So uh, we launched a campaign on beer tax in 2012 and there are millions and millions and millions of beer drinkers in the UK, as you can probably uh, guess. 
but you know they're never ever going to hear about any of this stuff you know they might not read the newspapers they not, might not watch tv but they certainly go to the pub so let's take it to the pub and we had these beer mats made and we talked to a few um pub groups in the uk and they distributed millions of them for us around the country so every time somebody was buying a pint they were seeing that a third of it was tax a nice simple clear message um and yeah, it's it's all it, that campaign was really all about taking it to the point, um, to to the tills where somebody was actually paying for their beer, and even if you know they didn't sign up for that particular campaign, they again were realizing that they were paying a lot of tax for a product that they enjoy consuming. So that um, campaign was very effective, and we actually got the first cut in beer duty uh, in 50 years um, as a result of that initial campaign, and it's been frozen ever since because uh, politicians are too terrified to touch it. It's a bad picture, but it's a similar thing, and it's not dissimilar from what Scott was talking about at um, gas stations, but at petrol stations in the UK, we, we again, um, on tills, we, on, on, the, uh, on the counters where you actually pay for your gas, we put these signs up showing just how much of uh, the total cost when they had their credit cards out or their cash out, how much of that was taxed. You know, um, we don't really have a low wage economy in the UK. What we have is a high cost of living economy. Everybody complains about the cost of living, and the reason that everything's so expensive is usually because of tax, if not regulation, but it's usually because of tax. Um, so again, outside of London, where people have to drive to work, where they don't have the benefit of the underground, um, we take that message directly to them, and we say, you know, you do realise that because you're, you're filling up your car costs 60 quid, you do realise that that was all because of tax, right? So we're actually taking it right out to the, the point of pain where they actually pay. That campaign was very successful as well. And it plays into part of what Ron was talking about this morning, um, when you know sometimes we start with policy first on our side of the argument. You know, we talk about details, we talk about numbers, and all the rest of it. But actually, um, what this this campaign showed is on the left, there's a chap called Will Straw, and he at the time he was running a left wing think tank, and they were advocating for increasing fuel duty. Um, and on the right, we have a lovely lady from the Sun newspaper, which is the mo most widely read newspaper in the UK. It's read by uh, mostly working class people. Um, and she joined us on the four courts to show that she wanted tax cut too. So um, this picture is actually from a blog in the UK that said, uh, you, know, you know, lefty wonks against the Sun newspaper. And there was only going to be one winner in that. And again, fuel duty was cut. And it's, again, it's been kept frozen for seven years since. And that's because they don't want to upset the lovely lady from the Sun. Um, there was supposed to be one more slide, but there isn't. Um, the, last, the last one was about uh, merging income tax and national insurance, and that's a campaign we've been running for quite some time as well. Again, that's about telling people how much tax they actually pay. We have this myth whereby we have an income tax and then we have another thing called a national insurance. The truth is it all goes into the same pot. It, it should just be called income tax and it should, uh, there should be tax honesty. Um, so it ties back to what I was saying at the very start in terms of our grassroots action days. Um, we need to tell people exactly how much tax they're paying and that sometimes that they're even paying tax to start with. So. Um, even though uh, we've not got a slide for it, that is a, another sort of element of that tax honesty campaigning that we do. But taking it to the places where people actually make these uh, decisions of purchasing items, fuel, beer, whatever, is very, very effective. Uh, like I said, most people in the U UK visit pubs. Most don't watch the news. So go to the pubs. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll go straight to it. As uh, I've mentioned, I come from Kenya, working with the National Taxpayers Association. So I'll just give a, a brief background of what's been happening back home. Uh, so Kenya uh, uh, changed its constitution and we currently are devolved. We have 47 uh, smaller pieces of Kenya. So uh, according to our constitution, then you find that the 47 counties have a right to uh, impose some certain type of uh, taxes. But our main concern has been, uh, they've been so fixed on uh, that tax as the only way of raising revenue, so that you find if you want to move from one county, they'll impose you pay a tax for your goods, the next you have to pay. So the cost of living has really shot up, and the cost of uh, doing business also. So for the business people, it doesn't make economic sense. Um, secondly, also has been the, uh, the corruption that you see in our context. If you've been reading the news, you see a lot of corruption scandals, you see that our government is always around with a begging bowl looking for more money and saddling us with debt. But our question then has been where does uh, it take our tax? And uh, 
which, which service delivery do we get because the state of public services is really poor. So we uh, had a partnership with uh, the Office of our Auditor General because the other concern we've had is the Auditor General uh, comes up with county reports every financial year that details the wastage in terms of how much taxes are being uh, misused. However, our uh, county assemblies that should be able to engage and call out corruption or ask the executive why they are misusing their money, they do not even look at those documents. So we say the first start for us would be to look at the, let me just make sure I'm okay. Yeah. So our first uh, point of call, we thought, would be to look at the assembly, the auditor reports for those assemblies, just to ask the assemblies first, do they themselves have the moral authority to call out corruption in the executive, while the auditor general has said that most of them, you know, all those assemblies waste taxes. So generally for us as a country uh, and as National Taxpayers Association, we are at the point not of pushing for specific uh, tax to go down, but generally for just prudent tax utilization. Uh, and so I'll just mention around three new taxes that the government in the last six months is trying to push down our throats. So there's the housing fund, where the government is saying it wants to uh, build for us, construct houses, uh, affordable houses, because half or three quarters of the population lives in informal settlement. But our position is that the government has not even been able to build enough schools since independence, which is 1963. So we are not really uh, confident that they can be able to, uh, uh, to construct the houses. And so the construction of the houses means that in your uh, monthly pay, we as the employees pay 1.5 of our salary to that housing fund, and the employer matches that. So that is 3%. It's a lot of money. While the only public fund, which is the National Insurance uh, Fund, is, is dogged by a lot of corruption. So we were wondering, is the government going to replicate the mess and the wastage in the, in the health fund, why don't they first address and then showcase the health fund to move us then to say that we are comfortable with doing the housing fund? So then we started looking at the Auditor General's report. And so our Auditor General's report looks like that. Those are the type of reports it gives. And having being that we have uh, 47 counties, you can see that no county had a qualified report. So out of the 47, most were at the disclaimer, uh, disclaimer report, meaning that the auditor cannot even form an opinion as to how our taxes has been used. So that was something that we were really worried about, and this is particularly with the assemblies, who should be uh, passing the finance bills, and who should be uh, providing oversight. Uh, so we did that, and the, the issues you are looking at, you can see, is issues around domestic and foreign travel that these assemblies engage in. Half of the budget, just to uh, point out that as they, uh, they tax us, you find that a significant of amount of the money goes to their foreign uh, travels and domestic travels. And if you look at this type of travel, it's interesting that they get money for, the, for foreign travel, but their passports are never stamped. So the Auditor General points to such things. So it's just obvious corruption of our institutions that should be providing oversight on our tax. So this was, uh, we just simplified this. You can also see uh, the issues of car loans and mortgages. So we give our elected leaders already a mortgage uh, and right now they are pushing, uh, today there's a matter in court in, uh, in Nairobi where they are pushing for an additional housing allowance when we're already giving them. So there's a lot of things we give them and you'd find that uh, even the houses that, or the mortgages, it's not co-registered in the name of the uh, county. So it is private property. As soon as their term is over, they go with these taxpayers' uh, benefits. Uh, so our, our assemblies don't even have audit committees, so there's generally no control over taxes. So our conversation as an organization has been, you do not need to tax anymore. Don't come up with new taxes when you've not demonstrated that even the little that you're being given, you are using well. And our target being the assemblies because they, are sh they should be the ones that uh, approve the finance bill that ra raise revenue. So you can see that a lot of the money goes to foreign travel, domestic travel, uh, so those are some of the, uh, uh, and most of them are unsupported. So if they've done foreign or domestic, there is no passport you're providing, there is no ticket. So generally we know that you did not go anywhere, you were just within. Uh, so this, this project really, the target was uh, the citizens, because uh, again in our context, the citizens were also, sometimes when you try to mobilize and tell them that, uh, let us go and either do a demonstration, go to Treasury and ask why are you getting us more debts, but you've not even given us the contract that our country is getting on with the lenders so that we understand uh, which uh, terms are we negotiating these deals on. Because that's the other uh, issue we've had, 
that the type of deals that our government is getting into, there's a lot of secrecy, there's no transparency. So we bear the cost of financing such agreements, but we don't know what we've gotten ourselves into. But we'd find that most of the taxpayers are not keen. Most of them don't see the value of participating in, in such conversations. So the hard part for us as an association is that we can't be alone. We need the masses behind us because it is their taxes that we are trying to uh, ensure it's efficiently used. But the disconnect, that they do not see the correlation between tax and service delivery. And uh, uh, the apathy, and almost in a sense, giving up. You'll find that most Kenyans have decided that they'd rather go to their daily jobs, try to get a shilling or two, and they've completely given up on, uh, on, uh, on public services. But we think that is, is, is the wrong position, because we continue to fund a significant part with the tax, but all of it goes to uh, inefficient usage, all of it goes to uh, allowances and issues that uh, the political class wants. So uh, this, this really went well uh, uh, when, when we uh, did this study because it was the first time that civil society was able to engage with the office of the auditor. And the auditor general himself came to the launch of the report where he said um, the simplification of that audit uh, report is crucial for empowering uh, taxpayers because they cannot engage with his deeper report. And we also did a, a letter and a request to the Senate because we do have an institution in our context uh, known as the Senate that should then be, if the county assemblies don't do the oversight role, the uh, Senate is uh, the one that should be protecting the interests of the counties. But the angle they have been taking is that to protect the interests of the counties is only to ask for additional funds to go to the devolved units. But our point is that to protect the interests of the counties, you also need to ensure that the little they get is efficiently used or take a position and say that we will not approve higher budgets for the devolved units until they demonstrate prudence. So based on our report, the Senate then called the governors who are the smaller presidents of the county and were holding them to account. But as you showed, you'd find that uh, all of those uh, smaller presidents have moved to, go to court saying that uh, they cannot report to uh, the Senate. So a lot of politics and uh, legal tussles, but we are happy that for us, uh, citizens have come to understand that their taxes uh, should directly correlate with, uh, with service provision, and they are also now engaging. So the second uh, set of reports has been uh, shared out by our Auditor General. And for once, we have seen that even before we started analyzing those audit reports, the Senate itself has started calling those uh, governors. And I'll welcome you just to uh, uh, check on Twitter and see that by yesterday, one governor was at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Court, where he swindled the, uh, his county of around 583 million that is deposited in his daughter's uh, account. So those are the crazy things that uh, are in our context. But we are also happy that the smaller, smaller steps have started where citizens and we have seen uh, two citizens moving to court to have funds frozen for their counties until it is demonstrated that that uh, resource is being used. So I think that is just what I wanted to share from Kenya and just to show that uh, it is possible to mobilize taxpayers to join in and to demand action from their governments, but only if you give them information that they can understand, information that is disaggregated, because the Auditor General does it as a bulk, but we went and did 47 specific. So if you're in County A, you'll only look at your audit problems for County A and then call your leader to account at that lower level. So you wouldn't have a, a business looking at the other ones, but you let each county engage with their audit report. So uh, thank you very much. And you can uh, look at our website. You can uh, join uh, the conversation. Today we have a very interesting tweet chat, as I said. Uh, the discussion is um, that our, we have an institution known as the Salaries and Remuneration Commission that should uh, review the salaries of the political class. But they refused and they added themselves salaries last week. So today the court decides, is it the jurisdiction of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission or is it the jurisdiction of the political class to, uh, to add their own salaries? So we welcome all the members of the World Taxpayers Association just to uh, put in a word from 2 p.m. when our court is sitting to decide that. Many thanks. Uh, hello, my name is actually Pablo. The, the, the paper is wrong, but that's okay. I, I can be Jonah for, for a while. So, uh, launching the taxpayer pledge in Argentina. So, uh, wait, uh, here. Uh, let me see. <laughs> well, the, the taxpayer pledge, as you know, was established by Robert Norquist in the United States. 
And well, we de we developed the idea of starting it and launching it in, in Argentina. Uh, to begin with, I, I will tell you some of the problems of Argentina regarding taxation. To begin with, we, uh, we are ranked uh, in the second place in the, um, in the total tax and contributions, uh, you know, the, 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 the famous report of the World Bank. Sorry, I can see far, so I, don't, I, I, I have to remember everything. I forgot my glasses. Um, and the other problem is that people, uh, as some, uh, some speakers said, in Argentina had very little conscious uh, of being taxpayers. I mean, now it's different. I mean, it's changing because the tax burden is, uh, is, sky, is skyrocketing. So people is actually feeling the, 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 the pain of paying the taxes. But uh, the idea of, the, of launching the pledge was not only to, to stop uh, new, new increases and new taxes, but also to, uh, to make publicity of the existence of the taxpayer itself uh, so that people can feel involucrated on, on the process. So uh, we launched on March uh, 2019 in, in Yosema. Here you have uh, the, the taxpayer pledge uh, displayed. That's well, basically the, the, the same design uh, Grover Norgis did. He helped us. Well, I think it, this, there's a missing picture here. We have a really nice picture with uh, Okay. It's later. So. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, but um, well, the 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 main problem, the main issue we had with the with the taxpayer pledge in Argentina was that people thought it was a, a silly idea. So um, you know, in Argentina, many people think uh, it's really smart. Uh, Sixty percent inflation. I don't know how we are smarter than anyone, but. <laughs> but, but well, that, that's uh, that's the, what people think. But well, and we heard many things like that that uh, the uh, Argentinian politician will outsmart the the pledge and and every every kind of objection like that. So it was difficult for us to to get uh, help from from people. So. Uh, we talked to the people from American for Tax Reform regarding this issue, and they helped us with uh, this report. So we recommend this, this report. This really helped us. It's a an, an study from the university. As I said, I don't have the glasses, so you please read it because I, it's really far. It, it's from, I, if I don't remember badly, it's from the University of Stanford and Berkeley. And it's a really accurate uh, report and study a scientific study of the behavior of the politicians, how the pledge affects the behavior, and how they, they, they change the behavior, and, uh, and what extent they feel the pain when they betray the pledge, and how they benefit for uh, fulfilling the pledge. And also, something important is that even if you don't advocate for tax reduction, for, for tax uh, cuts, uh, if you broke the pledge, people who is on the opposite side of the ideology, they even don't like this because it's like, uh, okay, he betrayed his ideas, he betrayed his uh, his beliefs. So, so why am I going to to endorse him uh, with my ideas if he uh, betrays his his old ideas? Well. Um, as, uh, well, the, the next step, once we did this, uh, sorry, one, one more thing about that. Uh, once we did this, uh, the resistance of people, uh, we could stop that. that. That funny, silly, what you're doing is silly, it's, it's not great. Uh, because, well, if this is backed by a scientific study, important universities, this help, really helped a lot. If you ever found that, uh, that kind of problem uh, of people saying it's silly, well, uh, this report and this kind of, of, of speech will, will really help. Uh, well, then we began to, to invite uh, politicians. Uh, it was a, a real, real fun process. Uh, they all said mostly, okay, I will sign it, there's no problem. They then don't call you any, uh, no one <laughs> again. They disappear. Uh, it was uh, most of them. And first, we, we feel frustrated, but then we realized that they were afraid of afraid of of signing, writing their names in in in, in the belief in in the pledge. So in that way, we prefer no one to sign it or very little to sign it. But that the pledge is scary. Even uh, we talked to a vice president in a, in Argentina, former vice president that is today 
uh, in, in office, in, in other churches, and he didn't want to sign it also. Uh, it was re real tough. Uh, I mean, the ruling party today, it's supposed to be center right wing, which is not, of course. They, they, they won the election with that promise, and then they changed, the, they put the, 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 the hat, uh, the Che Guevara likes, so they basically <laughs> betrayed everything they said. Uh, so, but uh, although that, that's what happened, uh, they were scared of signing that. Uh, even if every day they say, oh, I will uh, cut taxes the day, next, the day after they raise the taxes, they don't want something written. It's very clear they, they don't want to expose themselves. So that, I think that's another power of, of the pledge. Uh, well, then we get the first signatures. Uh, suddenly the one in the middle is missing. Uh, one congressman signed it from the ruling party. The, the ruling party uh, didn't want him to sign, but he did it anyway. Uh, he was uh, very happy. And then we have uh, candidates that uh, in the, on the left from Bloque Unir. Uh, the, and the, the one is, uh, a, was a can the candidate for Córdoba, one of our provinces, from the Partido Libertario, Libertarian Party. And, um, well, that did well. Uh, even now there is even competition, we, we realize, between uh, people to sign the pledge. For instance, on the left, Bloque Unir is uh, making a coalition with José Luis Espert, who is uh, president uh, of the Libertarian Party. He's uh, doing very well. He will, uh, he is uh, launching his candidacy for, for the presidency. And he's uh, having about five to 10% of the voters. So he's, he's doing well. So um, bottom line is um, even he didn't want it to, to sign, he, <laughs> the candidate of the Libertarian Party was in doubt, but making his, his, co his, um, his partners in the coalition sign, make him feel that he, he can't be less, so he's now going to sign it with all his candidates. So bottom line is, uh, well, that's the next step. It means uh, I'm running out of time, to, but I mostly explain Jose Luis Espert is the, the Libertarian Party candidate, so well, that's what it says. Uh, and the conclusion is, well, you can say that uh, the pledge helps with publicity, that the taxpayer protection pledge uh, has this scientific background, it helps to uh, stop the, the criticism of that is silly, that you are doing it silly, that people, uh, we, did it, uh, we wasn't expected, uh, expecting uh, people to make fun of, of the pledge, but we, we, was, we were successful to uh, stop that uh, conduct from people with this study. So, well, that's bottom line, our experience. Uh, I hope you, you liked it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, every time I hear the successful stories that you, uh, that the members here relate, uh, I take a back foot, you know, looking at how great your, your job has been and uh, how little we have done. But in any case, uh, let me just tell you what has really been happening. Uh, you know, a new goods and services tax has been introduced in uh, India. And uh, let me just give you a quick uh, you know, uh, review on what really has happened and uh, so far, and how a uh, what role we played in it. Let me just go through that. Well, indirect taxes were the only kind of tax that is written in our history books. Not the direct taxes do not find a mention. It, it's usually in the second century, it says uh, about six, one by sixth of the of whatever you produce, it goes to the uh, king or the ruler. So that's how possibly the indirect taxes started. And well, you know, over a period of time, it uh, withered away. <laughs> it just withered away over a period, sorry? <laughs> yeah, so the British reintroduced it in the Indian colony, of course. But, um, but when it came through, it took a much larger shape and uh, uh, lots of color added to it. Uh, in the terms of you know excise customs and uh, so many value additions uh, are for them value additions for the government I'm talking about okay so the uh, the tax was reintroduced in the Indian colony and when India became in, uh, independent we uh, the government 
of India was sure to inherit all those things and uh, they never really did change much, you know, except that the money was lying in India. Uh, and of course, we had more such taxes coming up with uh, divisions in the country. You know, there had been uh, language-based divisions. We had over uh, 20, uh, 26 different states in those uh, initially, and then now today it's about 28. And still, uh, whenever goods enter a different state, like whatever our Kenyan friend was referring to, you know, we had an entry tax and the states had their own sales tax, which of course later we called it as VAT. Uh, there was some reclaiming, but still there's lots of confusion. There was taxes happening at multiple stages. So in order to streamline all this, uh, the GST was introduced, which really subsumed about 22 different taxes in the country, uh, which included also the excise duty and others. Of course, uh, many of uh, the countries, I could see at least about 140 countries have GST already. So naturally, the GST in India was something that we had all fought for more than two decades. It was from 1998 or so, the first GST council was formed and we worked on it for nearly uh, 20 long years before the GST could materialize. And uh, the advantages, I've listed the pluses on one side, that there were, uh, it's something like whatever uh, Daniel was mentioning, every tax uh, you know, regime that comes in always follows the norms or the principles laid down. You know, it says it is simple, it says it is transparent, it talks about all those, but when it really comes into being, does that really happen is the big question. Okay, it really, uh, they talked of fewer returns, fewer red tape, and it's supposed to be greatly simplified. And more tra transparency in tax collection by giving a uniform tax rate across the board. So, well, all these were what was uh, planned, but of course, what really happened was something that uh, was a little surprising. We had about, uh, when it all started, we I used to file three plus another uh, four or five for people who don't who file excise duties. A total of about three returns on an annual basis and a monthly return. Today I have to file three monthly returns and uh, one annual return. Well, that means about 37 returns all in all in a year today. And when it used to be about. Um, three plus 12, but 15 and 15 reports in a year, year earlier. So well, it has not really reduced the amount of work that we do, but yes, it has brought in lots of uh, transparency in tax collection. It has reduced lots of corruption across the board. It has improved logistics between the states and across the country. So goods could move smoothly and comfortably across the country. And of course, we are uh, still to see any reduction in price, though that was promised by the uh, government that the end user will stand to gain uh, by a reduction in price because there is a, a value addition tax which could possibly be passed down to the end user. But that is yet to be realized, as you will see later on in some of my slides. Uh, the, well, before the GST really took off, uh, what we did, the role of India taxpayer in that. Uh, we try to bring in changes. Okay, even when the service tax and the other uh, earlier regime was there, we did try to bring in certain changes in their operation, which was later on incorporated in the GST as well. Some of these things include, you know, services that are provided to the government, which over a period of time, you know, you provide a service to the government and take a tax, collect a tax from the government, pay back that to the government again, right? So this was the looping of the tax money. You collect the tax from the government, pay back to the government. GST is also uh, uh, something like that. And when we started processing that even ahead of GST, we the government uh, accepted that and uh, removed you know, that particular clause, you know, where in case you provide a service to the government, then you need not collect tax and you need not pay it back to the government again. So the same things have been incorporated in the GST subsequently. Uh, so this is, these, are, these are a few examples that we, we have done on the uh, earlier pre-GST period. 
and we of course we try to get into the uh, council we try to get into the uh, into an advisory role or a con uh, consultancy consulting role but unfortunately we couldn't do that but we did get some of a member of the consultative committee down to our uh, um, uh, you know our association, and we made him present a, present whatever discussions were going on in the council before the GST. Okay, and now uh, the post GST. This is what we have noticed as an inflation. The inflation, uh, Im the GST was implemented uh, in uh, July on July first, two thousand seventeen. There was immediately a spurt in the pricing. And uh, well, as of today, it's at around 3%. And this is post-GST GDP growth rate. It's July 2017, implementation date. There was a overall GDP growth that we could see in the country. And well, I, I will quickly pause over. And I would like cover my colleague and friend, Mr. Venkat, to come and uh, give his uh, point of view on this. Thank you. Thank you, Shen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Venkat. I'm a chartered accountant and a tax practitioner for 30 plus years in India. I thought I would give my points with regard to the tax aspects uh, in India. See, in um, earlier period, you know, like uh, any income beyond a particular level was taxed as high as 90%. So that sent a wrong signal to mem members of the community, public, who are earning more money. So there was a tendency to evade tax when it was as high as 90%. Now the tax rates are reduced and it is 30%. And the compliance is improving. And um, our friend from Germany said only 50% of the people in Germany are paying income tax. I would appreciate your country because in our country only 4% of the population pays income tax. Okay, now after demonetization another 18 million people joined and it is now around 6%, still a long way to go. Okay, so... <clears throat> See, basically we had uh, issues like, you know, like inefficiency in administration. A lot of you know, like lapses. The the person heading the particular uh, department, you know, like uh, he doesn't have adequate knowledge, and there is no mechanism to prove that. Uh, ideally, a finance ministry guy who is in charge of direct taxes should be a chartered accountant or a tax expert. Somebody non-relating to this is heading that. And supposing a health ministry, it, is, it should be ideally he headed by a doctor or a physician who knows the pulse of the people. So that possibly will happen. Maybe 60, 70 years of now, like uh, uh, indifferent rule has uh, now like uh, led us to this level. Possibly things are improving. Things are certainly improving. And with the advent of uh, GSD, as Mr. Shantakumar was saying, uh, it is still not felt by the common man, as our friend from Argentina said. People are indifferent to that. People are indifferent to what taxes they are paying what constitutes their income and what uh, constitutes the tax amount. So they're indifferent. So if they, uh, you know, like they will try to avoid tax, but supposing they want to buy some consumable, they don't have a choice. As a consumer, they pay and buy any, uh, what to say, paste or a brush or um, anything, you know, that you, any consumable that you buy, is they pay taxes. So the awareness level has to improve. And not only that, now with the GST in place, we are, the, the monthly collection is one lakh crore. One lakh crore and annually it is no like more than a million crore. And when this money is consolidated, it appears to be no like a big money and a lot of opportunities are there to channelize that. And that is happening in the last few years. That is a good thing about it. Uh, no, uh, and no like one uh, being in practice for long years, I find sometimes no, the in our country, the promotion or increment is based on caste also. If you belong to a particular caste, you are automatically promoted, irrespective of the quality you have. So he doesn't possess the knowledge or the experience to handle the seat. And besides this, adding to our Kenyan friend said, a lot of corruption. 
So all these, no, like, will take a lot of time. And a population of 1.3 billion next to China, it takes a lot of time. A small country can be handled easier, but a country with such geographical stretch and uh, different culture and other things, no, like, it is difficult to make it happen. So it is taking a long time. So as far as GST is concerned, as my friend Shantangmar is observing, I would like to tell one thing, uh, which, you know, like, uh, lack of awareness. See, previously, pre prior to the GST regime, supposing I buy a product for $100 from a, from a trader, and I pay 5% on that, I pay 105 Now, that 100 rupees which I buy will contain 15 rupees of excise duty, manufacturing duty. That is ideally to be passed down to the consumer. His cost is actually, the manufacturer's cost is 85, and he charges 15 more and sells to the trader. Now, with the advent of GST, this 15 rupee is also ideally to be passed down to the consumer. And as he was rightly observing, this awareness has still not come in the mind of the consumers. They are not even aware. Only when they insist, no, like things will pass into the consumers, then consumers. <clears throat> and uh, with reference to our New Zealand friend who was talking about capital gains, our country, we pay 20% tax on the capital gains. <laughs> and we are used to that. We don't have a choice. So that's about it. And our act, first act was before independence in the year 1913. And after 48 years, it got amended in 1961. And there is about 59 years it is still to be amended. And we hope it will be amended. And you know, like the act, of, a lot of amendments are happening over every year over the budget. But the act is to be you know, like, uh, reframed with reference to a lot of changes that have taken place. So that way I feel you know, like uh, things are moving a little slowly, but in the right direction. Thank you for the opportunity. No, that's OK, thank you. Uh, um, I just want to go through the slides very fast to give you an example how how we work, what we did in the last years, and it's a very good symbol, the burning euro. That's uh, and yeah, yeah and, and it will be in the museum in, in, in Regensburg. It's contemporary history of Bavaria. Um, so because we did a campaign um, uh, against the European stability mechanism, I will tell you later on. But it may be important to know if we celebrate the 70th birthday, 100th birthday to, uh, here of the Australian Association. I think it's the eldest association. I'm not sure, but I, but I think so. And so we, we, are, we, are, we are an old association with, with some members, 230,000, 40,000 from my Bavarian Association. So it's not a small uh, group, it's not too big, but it's still a, a strong pressure group. Okay, and uh, and we do a lot of things. Uh, members call for action, uh, and what is new? What we learn from one of the, of the other as, as sessions, lead generation. So we need uh, addresses to work on because we have a subscribers to become a member, not only donors. So people in our association subscribe uh, contracts; they become a member of our association, and that's a different to, to other associations. And therefore, we need therefore we need a lot of contacts and addresses to work on, and that's why we. we learned to get leads and uh, email addresses to and, and also for financing activities. Um, I, I go through this. That's what the, uh, our campaign uh, stop uh, the burning money. It's European stability mechanism. Um, and we succeeded finally. And it was a very good campaign because uh, it's a very good symbol, the burning euro. And people dislike, dislike uh, uh, bureaucracy. And what we did, we did a lot of panel discussions. What is very funny uh, in the Conservative Party, uh, Thomas Silberhorn, who is now a State Secretary of Defense, um, he was supporting us. And uh, I, I, uh, if I remember correctly, only 68 uh, uh, members of parliament were supporting us. The others were in, uh, and wanted to vote for this European stability mechanism. And we, it, it was a successful campaign. And uh, Roy already left in the middle, so we went on the road. So we did something, activism, and we were, we were visible. And that's really good uh, because people loved it. We had only one problem, the left and the right. 
uh, were taking over the discussion. So we had from the radical left people say, yes, you're right. And the radical right people said, yes, you're right. And that was a, that showed us something is wrong in, in, in Germany. And then we, we, we stopped the Facebook campaign and all these things because they took over the discussion. But what is very interesting, we had more than 50,000, uh, 56,000 uh, supporters of this campaign um, subscribing on our web page. Uh, we did a big mistake. We did not make an opt-in. Um, said we are allowed to contact them again because it's to European law, um, data protecting law. You, you need you need an allowance now. It was a big mistake because we had around 60,000 addresses who want to act, uh, but we were not allowed to use it. That's what we learned out of this campaign. Another campaign: children are liable for their parents um, because we have too many debts, too much spending. It's very visible. We went on the road, and, and finally we had a very uh, big success in the election 2013 uh, in Bavaria. People voted for a ban of indebtedness. In the, in, the, in the constitution, you can copy it. If you have no ban in, in, in your of indebtedness in your constitution, try to copy this campaign. <coughs> and it, I think in, nowadays it would be much more complicated for us uh, to convince even the Bavarian voters because people are in favor of spending more and that's a big problem. So if you have the opportunity to ban, to balance the budget, try to copy these things. Um, the same of a waste scene. It's a very famous uh, crime, like like uh, criminal minds, something like this, in the German TV, and we copied this logo, like on a gun, and and it was also uh, very interesting. People supported us. We went on the road again, and then uh, with signature uh, uh, enough wasted. Uh, in, in French language, trolls, the trolls. That, that's a very funny campaign, and, and what we what we have, what is also interesting, if you have, if you're big enough, we have some discount for our members, um, special offers, and the, in, in our actual news uh, paper, mag monthly magazine, uh, people can say 41 percent is a special offer, a wine bottle, so it's it's good. So we we use these things. It's really uh, special for for our group, uh, for the members of the taxpayers as. Association. Um, and what we did cross sailing with other, uh, um, uh, we, we founded another association, uh, and it was very interesting for us um, because also to data protecting law, we cannot write to the members of the electricity corporate and say are not allowed, we cannot give the data to them. But we, we found a solution, so we were recommended in this group, uh, they were not member of our association, join the, the taxpayers movement. And we recommended our our members who are not uh, customers, clients of the electricity corporate. Listen, that's a member of us. You get a special discount if if you if you uh, make a contract there. And it brought us uh, this meeting brought us 200 new members. So it's it's not too bad. It's not too much. But we will re we renewal this year, and we do it every year once or twice. So it brings us 200 300 new members, paying members. Um, yeah, what well, is also uh, activism, ab abolition of solidarity, so change. It's, uh, we, for the unification of Germany, we, we had to pay for is 5.5 on the income tax. Um, and um, uh, it's a successful campaign. And it's, you see the, the blue one is the revenues, uh, the expenditures in Eastern Germany, and the gray one is, is the money going to the finance minister. And after this year, the whole amount, what we pay for the unification, is in the pocket of the finance minister. He's stealing our money. And that's why we went to court. We are not allowed directly to go to court, but we found a member, we found a member, and so we, we went a legal test case, and we think, we hope that the Constitutional Court will say, yes, you're right, because the unification, they do not spend the money, so they are not allowed uh, to, 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 to keep this uh, surcharge, surcharge. And for sure we went on the road. We always try to combine these things to be visible, and it's interesting for media, interesting to media, and that's my colleague of the uh, uh, German board, Rainer Holznagel, and to the right is uh, the leader of the, uh, of the Libertarian Party. So both are smiling, uh, but 
Okay, uh, for sure, people, activism to be visible. And what we do now, um, we do a spring cleaning, uh, 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 like your house. You, if before summer comes, spring, spring cleaning uh, activity, um, how to consolidate, consolidate it's a federal budget. Uh, cases, you, uh, waste of money, what we think. So listen, stop spending money in this way. And it's for media, it's, uh, it's, it's in, in the March, we, we publish it. And it's uh, for media, it's very interesting too. And for sure, I, I brought also a copy of um, Waste Book, a black, so-called Black Book. It's the most noticed uh, uh, press conference in Germany, even more than the uh, uh, um, 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 uh, Court of Auditors. Because it's not how to see how to say for media, it's very interesting, and we also uh, produce uh, a footage material for media, so like an interview. And uh, because we saw that at the press conference, a lot of, of the media colleagues do not join us anymore, uh, and also uh, radio or, or, or print media. So everything is complete finished, uh, like podcasts. They can use it, and so we have a very good coverage. Uh, in Germany, um, we collected its 200, 300 pages afterwards. What we can show the, that we were quoted in media in a, three days. It's always you can read about our black book. <coughs> and we have one um, uh, comedian in Germany, Mario Barth. He copied our black book. It's a show. It's four to six times a year. He is, uh, and Rainer is in this show too, um, and so he's reporting on the funny and, and crazy stories about the waste of public funds. That's very interesting. Sorry, we are not, uh, we are not uh, named as, as, uh, as the, uh, how to say, um, that we, that's our cases, because it's they want to sell advertise, advertising and these things. But uh, Rainer is in this show and it's good for us. Um, it's not too bad. It's in the main, the main, the main time, eight o'clock in the evening, um, in the private, uh, in the private, uh, private TV, um, and, and that's all for the moment. I just want to show um, all these activities, and I learned lots also from 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 your uh, side, uh, John, with the spear taxation for sure, excise tax. We have it too, and and, and what we think about now is the, this um, double taxation. We have. Um, fuel tax and on the tax or tobacco tax, we have value-added tax on top. Uh, I think it's not fair if you have 90% value-added tax on the on the tobacco tax. Um, it, it's not a fair system. So and and, and also in Germany, more than 50%, 60% of of the fuel uh, costs, uh, electricity costs, come from the government because it's taxation. And um, thank you. I want to end also with the last campaign. What we do now, our colleagues from from uh, from Northern Westphalia, we have a road constructing fee. If roads are constructed, uh, you as an owner, you have no no choice. Um, you have to pay for it. If you want or not, they can do everything what they want outside for the renovation. Not, but if they make new, the road new, you have to pay for it. And we succeeded in Bavaria to stop it in the in, uh, uh, in, in the Bavarian constitution. Uh, it's very good success to us. And our colleagues from North and Westphalia until today have more than 450,000 supporters. And they, they start now, they had an opt-in. Uh, I think 20% gave an opt-in to be phoned, to be contacted. And they start now to phone them, listen, we, uh, we, we will succeed, we went to court, and, and so on and so on. You, you want to become a member? And it's, it's, I think 10% of the phone calls become members now. It's a very good quota. And so it's, that's what I learned years ago. Years ago at the World Conference, Leeds. You need addresses to work on. And that's a good story for us too. Sorry, it's, it's banned in Bavaria yet, but can you imagine 450,000 supporters whom you can contact, who potential members of the Northern Westphalian uh, Taxpayers Association. So it's not too bad. So some insights. If you need further information, we can talk tonight or tomorrow or Monday, winery. Let's, <laughs> let's fight together. Thanks so much, Michael, and thanks uh, to everybody else who contributed. I wanted to uh, uh, finish up. Um, we've got about, uh, I guess, 10 more minutes or so, um, and there were some questions that uh, were, were less left unanswered. Um, and anyone from uh, uh, the, uh, the groups that um, were speaking, if, if anyone wants to um, uh, provide their perspective on, on these questions, uh, I'd welcome 
those contributions. So um, uh, I don't know if he's still in the room, but Stephen Clively uh, had a question about Pigouvian taxes. So uh, those who are familiar, Arthur Pigou um, was uh, an economist who looked at um, tax policy as a way to minimize externalities, the harms to uh, people um, around uh, around you by whatever activity um, you make, whether that's uh, you know it, we think of these things as as pollution or or smoking or or things that impact people around you, activities that you can have, and whether a tax um, is the right tool to. Um, to minimize that behavior and to um, uh, offset the, those costs. The problem is uh, that a lot of times when you're administering a Pigouvian tax, is you're not actually uh, administering it in a, in a way that that actually minimizes those externalities. Um, one of the things that you would want to see if you're administering a Pigouvian tax in the right way is those activities decreasing, but rather um, you're seeing those costs just shifted on to other parties. So the externalities don't necessarily go away. The pollution oftentimes doesn't necessarily go away. Um, there's this you know, cap and trade mechanism or there's a, a shifting of the costs to employees or a shifting of costs to consumers. Um, so it doesn't necessarily change, uh, change the, uh, the behavior but you can have tax systems that are efficient, that don't distort behavior um, and allow uh, people to make the choices uh, that they want. So it's a, qu a question of paternalism, really. Um, do you want to limit people's freedoms through taxes and, or through regulation or what tool do you use? Um, and a lot of times the, the tax is not necessarily the, the right choice. In theory, we can have a lot of things working, but in practice, um, they don't necessarily work out uh, the, the way you would expect them to. Um, there's uh, Anybody want to add to that? Oh, thank you. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Is, uh, let's see here. Uh, Sebastian uh, asked, uh, is there any evidence to suggest that personal income tax cuts make a tax jurisdiction more attractive to foreign nationals and entities, which leads to an increase in taxpayers, but a de decrease in individual tax burden. So this is this is a little bit of what I would li uh, like to call Laffer curve logic. Um, and it, it, so, so the answer is yes, it can in some circumstances. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of different reasons that people would want to move from where they are currently to a different jurisdiction. In the United States, we have uh, in, individual states have income taxes and in some, well, not all states have income taxes, but individual states have authority to set tax policy however they see fit. Uh, a lot of them conform to the national, the federal uh, government tax tax code for business taxes and things like that. But a lot of states, you know, choose not to have a sales tax or they choose not to have an income tax. And what you see is that for the people whose those those policies really impact their decisions, they are going to move. So what you see a lot of times is when people retire, they'll move to Florida because there's no income tax, um, and they don't have to pay uh, pay income tax on their on their retirement. Um, or they'll, uh, you know, folks will pay attention to where they, you know, if they live close to a state that doesn't have a sales tax, they'll go across state borders and buy, um, you know, make large purchases in another state and then bring them across, across state borders. And of course, there's no customs enforcement on state borders uh, in the U.S. that would be unconstitutional. But you, ha you certainly could have a situation where a lower tax um, rates on personal income does attract foreign nationals to your country. Now, the question then is whether it would actually increase your tax base. And it really depends on your tax um, tax design um, and whether there's an actual net revenue increase from having more people uh, in your tax base depending on how low you bring those rates. If you bring those rates to zero, then of course there's not going to be any net revenue increase um, from your uh, from, uh, from foreign nationals moving to, uh, to your country. Um, so there's there's certainly trade-offs there. Uh, I think there was one other question. Uh, yes, which factors are more critical uh, to make? Which particular statistics are more critical to make in uh, tax reform uh, debates to make sure that the, uh, your effort is successful? So I would say it really depends on the particular context. If you want to have a successful uh, tax reform effort in your country, you have to pay attention to what matters to people in, in your country, whether it's uh, something that impacts uh, large businesses or small businesses or families or, um, or retirees. 
it's, it's important to know the context. You can't simply, uh, one of the things I should have mentioned in my talk is when Tax Foundation engages in different states or different countries, we don't come in saying, hi, we're here from Washington, D.C., and we're here to help. Our goal is to always engage with a local partner so that we can understand the local politics, um, the local culture, the local uh, history, um, so that we're not necessarily just bringing in a solution from way across the sea um, to, uh, to implement in a, in a particular context. One of the things that uh, uh, a lot of folks in DC remember and sometimes harken back to is what was called the Washington Consensus of the late 80s and 90s with the World Bank um, and IMF approach to policy making um, in uh, particularly in Eastern Europe after um, the fall of, fall of communism. Um, the policy experts would come in and they would have their set proposal. Um, and uh, Gia John Derry pointed me out to this, but they would have a, uh, for, for many countries, they would bring up tax, uh, tax law, which they labeled Taxistan. So it's a model tax law that they developed. They said it's best for everybody, and we're just going to take it and have everybody adopt it in the same way. That's not the approach that we like to take when we're engaging in different contexts. Um, and I think for any anyone's country, anyone's particular situation, it's paying attention to the needs of your country or the particular issues of your tax system um, to be able to um, to make improvements that are um, worthwhile and lasting. Um, uh, that about covers it for the Whova questions, and we're almost out of time. Um, I, I think we'll just close it there.